Okay, good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to today's panel discussion on cybersecurity and digital manufacturing um, with the topic securing machines and processes. Uh, my name is Dr. Hammond Pierce. I'm a postdoc at the New York University Tandon's Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering's Center for Cybersecurity, and I'm also the host of this event. Um, first, let me acknowledge our sponsors, the National Science Foundation and the NYU Center for Cybersecurity, who uh, make these kinds of events possible. The idea around these panel discussions is that traditional manufacturing is increasingly being supplanted with new technologies. Factories at the moment are becoming smarter and more interconnected, and new manufacturing techniques are increasingly being adopted, like 3D printing and smart hybrid manufacturing. However, with these new advances comes new risks, especially within the cybersecurity domain. In this webinar series, the NYU Center for Cybersecurity is hosting four panel discussions. Uh, with experts from academia and industry. All of the events are being recorded and made available on YouTube, and they're an opportunity for you to directly ask questions to some of the leading experts in the field. It's our hope that the conversation that emerges from these events can inspire some of the future research efforts in the area, and to also introduce new and interesting ideas to all of our attendees from academia and the industry. This is the second webinar in the series hosted by NYU Tandon. Um, the idea behind this one is a focus on the cybersecurity requirements within securing the machines in the industry and the processes that they're involved with. As manufacturing is be increasingly becoming online and more interconnected, the risks of cyber attack only grow. And we've already seen several high profile attacks such as Stuxnet and the German steel mill fire. So these vectors are already beginning to be exploited. We're very fortunate to have three eminent panelists with us today. I'll briefly introduce each and then they'll quickly take over and talk about themselves and their areas. Uh, firstly, we have Kyle Adriani, who is the Director of Customer Operations at Link3D, which is an additive workflow MES software that helps businesses maximize their return on additive manufacturing assets. Prior to his work at Link3D, Kyle co-founded and served as the CTO at Additive Rocket Corporation, a new space propulsion startup. He's also acted as the quality and production manager for Additive Solutions, an advanced manufacturing service provider to the aerospace and defense industries. Kyle studied material science and plasma physics at UC San Diego and earned his BS in materials physics in 2016. Secondly, we have Dr. Mark Yampolsky, who is an associate professor at Auburn University in the Department of Computer Science and Software Engineering. He is also affiliated faculty with the Auburn Cyber Research Center and the National Center for Additive Manufacturing Excellence. He received a PhD in computer science from Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich in 2009. He is among the pioneers and is one of the leading experts in the field of additive manufacturing security, and his research interests focus on cyber physical means of attack and defense in additive manufacturing. Finally, we have John Hoyt, who is a lead cybersecurity engineer at the MITRE Corporation. He specializes in cybersecurity for the manufacturing sector, as well as operational technologies used in critical infrastructure. Prior to joining MITRE, John spent over 10 years as a systems integrator, helping to automate factories producing everything from automobiles to toilet paper. He has an ME in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Maryland, and a BS in electrical engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology. I'm very pleased to welcome our three panelists. Now I'll request each panelist to take a few minutes to give an overview of their work related to this area. Um, and from now, attendees, you can ask questions using the Q&A of utility built into Zoom. So if the attendees, uh, sorry, if the panelist is saying something interesting to you that you'd like to know more about, just straight away pop a question into the Q&A um, and I'll see those questions and I'll be able to deliver them um, to the panelists. Uh, once the panelists have uh, finished their introductions, we'll then move on to the sort of open floor area. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, Kyle, do you want to take us away first? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's see here. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. I'd like to take my time here to talk a little bit about Link 3D uh, and what we do and how it relates to the additive manufacturing ecosystem as well as security and the topic here. So as Ammon mentioned in his intro, thank you for that. This is uh, Link3D is an added manufacturing workflow tool that leverages the cloud and a connected infrastructure to enable real-time visibility into your manufacturing 
floor. The goal with this is to increase operational efficiency and utilization of high value additive manufacturing assets. Uh, Link3D is an industry leader in this area uh, that serves really the end-to-end -end workflow and acts as the operating system for our customer's manufacturing floor. This is everything from order entry, once a part is released for manufacturing from a CAD tool, all the way through delivery and data analytics. We have a connected ecosystem that ties into many uh, machines, build prep tools, and uh, corporate authority data layer, ERP and PLM tools as well. Uh, with our integrated and unified data model, we have the ability to do real-time exchange of data throughput and lead to higher traceability and quality. And these are some of the main value adds that our customers get from our cloud-based MES solution, manufacturing engineering, uh, sorry, manufacturing execution system. Uh, this allows for a closed loop of a repeatable AM process so you can track your parts and have traceability and their digital thread all the way through the end-to-end -end workflow. Uh, one major element which I think is relevant is our machine connectivity add-on. This is a tool within Link3D that allows our users to do real-time monitoring of machine-specific parameters and details in a cloud environment, see alerts and track uh, these details for their high value shop floor assets. Here's a really simplified overview of what uh, the architecture of this connected solution is. At the bottom here, we have machines on a local area network. Currently, these machines are really representing data silos that are only internally accessible and are not really being leverage for their full value. And these include major machine brands, IoT devices, and those things. And our solution provides a gateway to a cloud tool. And especially with the context of this panel, you may think, why would you punch a hole in your network, add risk uh, in the form of this gateway in order to gain some visibility? And we uh, some visibility into your manufacturing process. And we understand that those risks exist and so do our customers. And they're also weighing that risk of increasing your attack surface externally by having a network boundary being traversed with the huge value add they get from having a unified location to see and act on this data. Uh, and I think that's a, a good, oh, sorry. I think that's a good lead in to this. Um, and yeah, that's all, that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, and we'll just quickly now move to um, Professor Jan Polsky. Let me try to share my slides. I hope you can see it. Yes, we can see it. Perfect. So I uh, I only prepared a few slides and uh, I, I hope as it uh, it will explain the uh, at, at least uh, some of our research area stands and especially when we are talking about AM security and uh, it is very tempting to confuse it with cybersecurity and many people are doing this. Uh, and the, therefore I put together this diagram. So cybersecurity is somewhere here in the middle. Right, and it is based on applied cryptography, which is based itself on the cryptographic primitives, etc. So this this is a very well uh, understood and very well developed field. Around the cyber security, this uh, field of cyber physical security, it also takes into account uh, all kinds of cyber physical interactions like side channels and similar, or fault injections uh, attacks. Uh, Usually or originally you would see uh, this kind of research in embedded system security domain, 
But nowadays, with IoT security and also with cyber physical systems, we see more and more examples of cyber physical security percolating to different domains. So AM security is somewhere on the top of it, or it incorporates everything what is also uh, has been shown in cyber physical security and cyber security, etc. But it also adds some additional unique aspects that have not been shown in the other domains. And this is it's important to understand that AM security is not equal to cyber security. And at the same time, you cannot remove cyber security from the equation of AM security. Without cyber security, AM will not be secure, uh, never. At the same time, uh, you, you cannot just say that if cyber is solved, then AM is secure. And obviously, AM security is also part of more broader domains, uh, such as supply chain security or industry for the zero security and similar. Another thing I want to emphasize is that AM security is highly multidisciplinary. So uh, the, uh, uh, at least in the research that I'm doing, I usually collaborate with people from uh, different scientific disciplines. Uh, I come from security background, so, and also from cyber physical systems. So uh, this helps with AM security and CPS security, but at the same time, uh, a lot of work that I'm doing, it requires uh, knowledge in material science, mechanical engineering, also some in signal processing. So, uh, and AM security is somewhere on intersection of these domains. This means that uh, you really need to build teams uh, of experts in different domains to solve hard problems in, in this field. So, this is basically it, what I wanted to share. And let me... Let me stop sharing if I manage this. How do I do this? Uh, just at the top, hit, uh, stop sharing. There'll be like a red button or something. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, and lastly, uh, we have John. Can you briefly introduce? Yeah, uh, so I'm John Hoyt from the MITRE Corporation. Uh, I was going to try and just say a little bit about uh, who MITRE is and what we do in this area. So um, MITRE, uh, you know, we solve problems for a safer world. Uh, so we are a nonprofit that runs uh, a group of um, things called FFRDCs, Federally Funded Research and Development Centers. And so we do a number of different uh, areas. Um, and of course, the one that's most interesting here is the National Cybersecurity FFRDC. Um, so as part of that, we do a, a lot of different research uh, in cybersecurity for all different sectors. Um, touch on a few things. Of course, the most relevant things here are industrial controls and things like that. Uh, one of the things MITRE has become known for is the MITRE attack model. So that's adversary tactics, techniques, and common knowledge. Uh, several years ago, we released one for traditional uh, enterprise systems. Um, and last January, we released one for industrial control systems. Uh, a re recent update just came out last week, so uh, please go check it out and see what it looks like. Um, the National uh, Cybersecurity FFRDC uh, works in partnership with NIST to run what's called the uh, National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. Um, and so what we try to do there is to, you know, look at solutions for, uh, for cybersecurity that actually can be implemented in the industry. Um, and so I lead the group there that works in manufacturing. And so it's just a little bit about how, uh, how it all ties together, right? So NIST, uh, underneath NIST, um, we work at the NCCOE. And some of the things that we develop are what are known as cybersecurity practice guides. So if you're familiar with the NIST 1800 series, um, those are published uh, in partnership with MITRE through NCCOE. And then we look to do other types of uh, informational uh, I don't know, informative uh, uh, documents or webinars or series and, and short videos to help uh, teach people how to apply uh, cybersecurity in the real world. Um, so that's a short uh, intro to MITRE and what I do there. Thanks, uh, John. Okay, uh, so from here now, um, we'll move on to the next part of the webinar, which is where we're just going to sort of open the floor um, and, you know, build a conversation around these areas. Um, we've got quite a lot of attendees, so I do encourage all of you, you know, um, you can put any questions.
question that you want into the Q&A thing, um, and I'll take those questions and you know read them out and um, use those to inspire the discussion as well. Um, but to just get us started straight off the um, bat, um, I think you know uh, we've got already you know already that has happened, which I mentioned in the introduction. There has been a number of examples of major cybersecurity hacks on manufacturing systems. Um, and you know, what do you think are going to be the major risks moving forwards for people who are you know working in this area, who have got um, uh, you know manufacturing systems that they want to look after themselves? Um, so, what are the what are the key things that people should be looking at? You know, the the you know risk number one sort of thing. What what is the first thing people should be thinking of moving into um, upgrading their systems or or you know starting a new one? So that question's for everyone. Uh, so there's a number of different risks that are going to affect different uh, uh, entities in different ways, right? So if you're a defense supplier, you know, creating products for the defense industry, uh, your risks are going to be uh, much greater and you're going to be looking towards, you know, uh, persistent threats, you know, uh, nation state adversaries. If you're producing, you know, um, I don't know, uh, dice or, you know, some plastic widget that uh, for kids to play with, your risk profile is going to be much different. You're going to be looking towards protecting your intellectual property and things like that. Um, kind of the biggest thing, you know, uh, they always talk about the air gap, um, which we all pretty much know is not real. Um, so, you know, you, you want to build your security in layers. And so the first thing you want to do is look towards, you know, making sure your, your uh, you know, you've built a good fence around it, but then you need to go to the next layer and start looking at where you can protect things inside and look for um, uh, the adversary activity or, or things going wrong inside. That's my start on it. So, Mark or Kyle? Uh, okay, let, let me go next. I uh, agree with John. It, it really depends on who you are in, uh, and what you are doing and what, uh, uh, what you are manufacturing and i would assume that majority of attacks will be on the side of technical data theft or intellectual property theft uh, just because it is uh, uh, the uh, potential adversary can get benefit faster but at the same time the most impactful attacks will be probably sabotage attacks especially if you're considering uh, defense applications, if somebody can sabotage uh, parts that are going into F-16 uh, or F-35 or whatever, airplanes or other military gear, this will ground pretty much all planes that are using these parts or all planes or uh, equipment that is using additive manufacturing. And uh, I am pretty sure that adversary state actors uh, or state actors or uh, Will uh, look and maybe they already work on this uh, uh, attack direction. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad Mark mentioned uh, these parts and really compromising geometries, compromising processes and machines, and bringing critical to supply chain manufacturing resources across the country or across an enterprise down. Right by opening up machines to increase their usability, we're also exposing another vector of attack into machines where they could be disabled, they could be compromised, where the parts they produce cannot be trusted. And I'm sure we'll get into some of the very exciting ways that you can counteract that. Yeah, I. Um... So this is just going to come from my own background now. I have done a small amount of work uh, in my life within an industrial environment. And to say that cybersecurity was a focus would not be accurate. Uh, you know, the, the people that I were work with, the people that I was working with and the, you know, the supervisors and managers, they didn't really have an appreciation for the risks involved and also, you know, any desire to invest you know, effort, time, money into securing from those risks. Would you say that there is more motivation? You know, this was a few years ago, not that long ago, but a few years ago. Um, would you say that there is more, you know, the motivation for securing um, 
people's processes in factories are, is increasing over time? Or do you think that there's still a lot of inertia in industry where, people, you know, default passwords, just not that much interest in, in the, the sorts of, you know, the sorts of best practices that people should be interested in? Do you think people are, you know, really looking for, you know, looking to secure their things? Or is it going to be something that we get a big surprise in, in two or three years when there's going to be a major hack and people go, well, you know, I never even thought I needed to secure that? Yeah, I'll take that one. We, we see the whole spectrum from customers and industry uh, really tackling this head on, having blinders to it, as you can imagine, as you're discussing, and, and also taking it very seriously, deadly seriously, and really seeking to build out a huge amount of infrastructure to try to secure IP data processes and equipment. Uh, I, I agree with this scale, uh, and I, I think it is uh, also from my conversations with people uh, who are doing additive manufacturing uh, for a living. Uh, everybody is concerned about security, but uh, everybody's enterprise, uh, everybody's security posture is different. Some prefer to take risk because no major hacks or no major attacks have been reported or publicly disclosed. Uh, and I have heard from many people that a lot of money will be put as soon as first attack will be uh, broadly reported. Uh, at the same time, you also need to consider that majority of manufacturers, at least in the United States, are small, medium-sized uh, companies and they just don't have the resources uh, and capabilities to uh, address this uh, problem alone. And therefore, uh, I, I, th I think what uh, Link3D is doing, this is amazing uh, in the sense that it will provide solutions that other companies can just apply and secure their manufacturing uh, processes. Yeah, I'll, I agree with my two fellow panelists, but you know, the, there still is very much a, a mindset of you know, production Production comes first, right? Availability is is number one. If we're not producing widgets, we can't do cybersecurity, right? So if we're not, you know, but then there, there is a, a broadening realization of the need for cybersecurity. And so as they are able to, um, they're working to implement these things. As Mark mentioned, you know, a lot of small and medium-sized manufacturers, you know, they don't have, you know, they're competing on price to, to supply to, uh, an auto manufacturer or something like that. And so it's hard for them to uh, find the resources to do that cybersecurity. Um, I, my hope is that as we go forward, there'll be more um, kind of security built in by the automation vendors. Um, you know, if we think back, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you would buy a home router and it would come with a default password or password. Uh, but now in the last five years or so, you know, it now comes with a, a uh, a, you know, a random key string printed on the bottom of it, right? That's much better. It's not perfect, right? But it's much better. And so, you know, getting the automation vendors to do that type of thing uh, for their controllers so that you're not just using a hard-coded key or things like that, so. Yeah, um, so I've got a question from the audience, um, actually, which is uh, along the lines of, you know, if we know that there's all these risks of cybersecurity, why are we pushing for it? Why, why are we connecting all of the machines? What is the benefit? Uh, so uh, this is, might be a question for Kyle, actually, given coming uh, from your background. You know, why why are we doing these things? Why why do we want to connect everything to the internet? Yeah, it it uh, would seem counterintuitive that you would punch holes in your network so that you can see a graph on a web application of your machine state, this side or the other. Uh, the value add, however, is deep. The value add in data persistence and availability, uh, high level views of machine and machine activity across an enterprise system of disparate sites is also immense. Uh, and some of our main value adds are this ability to schedule and plan time and squeeze utilization out of very high value, uh, half to multi-million dollar AM assets that are 
still very new assets in a maturing industry. So there's a lot of value there to be extracted. And it's always that game, as John said, uh, you need to manufacture first uh, and then customers grow and they look to, oh, I really should get my house in order and protect these things. Uh, but always coming back to the value add and trading off those risks and rewards is the key. And, and essentially what the industry has been deciding lately is that the risks are well worth the reward of having a connected ecosystem. So actually related to that, we've got a, um, a question coming in, another question coming in from the audience, which is, you know, if people do want to start thinking about cybersecurity, you know, say they're a small to medium sized industry, you know, maybe they're not, they've not worked on anything sensitive yet, but they're going to start working on things that are sensitive. What are the resources they should be looking at? Um, where, where can they go to get, you know, the, the help that they need to, to start getting their house in order as the, as the wording you used? Yeah, and that's probably a great question for John. Uh, for us, we we leverage a lot of other industry available tools in monitoring. Uh, Amazon GovCloud is a major resource that is used, and customers of ours layer on top of that, uh, particularly in defense, uh, using uh, trying to move towards trust-free environments, trying to create stateful packet inspection systems that expose threats and prevent tampering with high value intellectual property. So the best resource here would be John. <laughs> yeah, all right, John. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about a few different things that, uh, that are of good resources. So of course, the cybersecurity framework, um, NIST cybersecurity framework is a good place to start. Um, it gives you a framework for uh, evaluating your risks and where your, your uh, holes may be. Um, NIST has also put out a, I forget the exact publication number. I, uh, I thought about having all the, the whole list of publication numbers in front of me, but I, I don't. But so um, the, one of the things that the cybersecurity framework does is you create a profile for your specific industry. And NIST has published one for the manufacturing industry. And so you can look at it and you can see, okay, what are my priorities? Is my priority safety? Is my priority you know, availability or, or whatever else? And look there in order to understand what parts of the cybersecurity framework you should focus on. Um, so some of the other things that we put out of uh, the, the cybersecurity practice guides, the 1800 series, um, there's a number of those for traditional uh, systems. So like email or, or uh, regular IT data integrity. Um, we're working on one for the manufacturing environment that's broad in terms of the data integrity. Um, and there was one I put out uh, a couple of years ago around uh, behavioral anomaly detection tools that could be implemented in the manufacturing environment. So uh, in addition, and of course, in addition to the cybersecurity framework, there's also uh, the risk management framework out of NIST. Um, that's another way, it's a much more in-depth. And then um, for folks, uh, gonna get the, hopefully I got the number right, it's uh, 800 is a complete list of uh, uh, controls around um, Kind of supply chain management um, that is being used by DOD uh, to, to uh, secure the defense industrial base. Um, so I've got a question for Mark actually, which is um, based on your background of it, Mark, from working in industry and then coming into academia. Um, you mentioned in your introduction about the sort of cross-disciplinary nature between, you know, the different fields of the cybersecurity and the materials and so on. Do you think that those different fields are good at working cross-disciplinarily with one another? Or do you think there's a little bit of, you know, in our actually our, our previous panel discussion, one of the points that was brought up was uh, a lot of the different professional societies even use different language to mean the same things or, or you know, they have the same words meaning different things. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess just some kind of your thoughts on, you know, how, how effective is the bridging between the different disciplines to achieve this kind of security area? Uh, let me put it this way. It is challenging, but at the same time, it is necessary. Uh, and uh, as opposed to the prior question, where uh, you are looking for tools and uh, for some solutions, in academia, you are usually looking for hard problems at... Uh, uh, technology readiness level zero, right? So something completely out of, out of the box or so something that hasn't been explored before. 
and therefore you uh, really try to understand things that uh, okay, haven't been understood or investigated before. And nowadays, you really need to go into interdisciplinary fields. And uh, the main, uh, uh, okay, maybe the, the, the only way to solve this problem is to build uh, interdisciplinary teams. And for this, you really need to find people who are interested on uh, doing research together. This is probably the biggest challenge because uh, you, you really need to uh, uh, to try with many uh, different partners to find uh, partners you can and want to work with. And this is uh, just a, a solution that I found. Uh, at, the, at the same time, sometimes you have luck and you find uh, good partners who are willing to learn a little bit of your language and you have to learn a little bit of their language so that you can somehow communicate with each other. But you're absolutely right. Uh, different disciplines have silos. Unfortunately, the reality uh, doesn't have silos, right? Uh, not what we have in academia. Um, and uh, I guess related to that, John, do you see those kinds of silos in, um, you know, coming in from MITRE being a, you know, cybersecurity and, and uh, risk management teams coming in with, with against the frameworks that people are using in industry as well? Um, yeah, very much. There, you know, everything from the IT and the OT silos to even in OT, you know, different industries have. Uh, address these problems in different ways, or you know, some of them have admitted there's a problem and are already working towards the solution, whereas other ones are still new to the game. Um, I'm not going to say government regulation is the only thing that that is going to solve things, but it's certainly electric industry with NERC SIP uh, has has really woken the electric industry up to the the problems and has driven a lot of of work in that area, and so. Um, even if you're not in a regulated environment such as manufacturing you know especially additive manufacturing this is a new new area and so there's not going to be any government regulation but you can look to those types of things to understand what are the priorities or what things uh, could be used to help to help your industry um, this so so building on that what would you say are the priorities for workforce development at the moment um it, i think there's a lot of them uh <laughs> But uh, yeah, as Mark was saying, you know, working across these things, right? Bringing the IT folks. Um, one of the things we've had good success with is is just tabletop exercises, right? Bring the IT folks into the room, bring the OT folks into the room, and talk about what the, the threats are, talk about what the solutions are, and then that helps to the IT folks to understand what's going on, uh, what are the possible things that can happen, and it also helps the OT folks understand what the underlying computer systems are that that could potentially be vulnerable. Um, yeah, so we've seen a lot of good success across those things. Um, cool. Um, yeah, um, so this question's probably coming in for Kyle, actually. Um, do you see that manufacturing, so people that are actually building equipment now, that there is, you know, as John was saying earlier, home routers used to be terrible with all default, the same default password, and now we've ideally got a unique password for each router. Do you see that kind of um, philosophical change also happening within the additive manufacturing space already? Or is it still something that needs to happen? Right, I, I think that, so where we're starting from is a situation where everything is completely siloed and not connectable. And we're slowly transitioning to a connectable infrastructure where a lot of IT and individual effort is needed to actually connect a machine to an IT infrastructure in a meaningful way. Uh, and that's still a read only way uh, for most circumstances. So I think we will get there. That'll probably sneak up on us, but we're not yet at the point where any of this is plug and play like a home router. So because the nature of the technology slows us down a little bit, we have that time to really build up the proper network infrastructure to tunnel out the right information and prevent access inward. Yeah, um, so I've, I've just got a question that's coming from the audience, which I think is 
quite related to what you're saying there is um, what do you, we kind of hinted at it before, but what do you think would possibly be the major turning point for people to, to start taking security first? Would it be that we would need a big public attack or, or could it be something that's just an awareness campaign that we could do? Right. And, and I think history has proven that it would probably unfortunately be a big public attack. Uh, you mentioned a few at the top of the call that are fresh and our minds in the industry as vulnerabilities. And we see the industry is very reactive to these. Something happens, everybody's manager says, are we vulnerable to this? And then that filters down to all their suppliers of which we're just one in our large customers, huge IT infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, this is a, a bit of a topic change now. Uh, so in, for better or worse, in the, uh, the past couple of weeks and months, uh, blockchain based technologies such as non fungible tokens um, have been big news. Uh, do you, you know, there's, there, there's already been proposals for things like NFTs for IP management of additive manufacturing parts. I've, I've seen those appear. Um, do you think there's any uh, benefit or, or use for this technology within the, the integrations of cybersecurity and additive manufacturing? That, that could probably be a question for everyone being quite uh, cutting edge in the, in the tech. Who wants to blockchain first? Uh, let me start first. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm not a... Uh, like, Blockchain is a very popular and it is buzzword right now. And I think this is also the danger uh, that many people applying this buzzword uh, to everything and everywhere, they does or does not make sense. And I think this is a danger because uh, when you are applying some technology, you really need to understand the benefits. And uh, often I see that people just applying for the sake of technology and not uh, because it brings some value that doesn't uh, uh, so that you can get this other uh, approaches. So. Uh, uses for blockchain that we see are really in the immutable ledger aspect, storing that transaction information and providing long-term manufacturing traceability. Think a Boeing plane goes down and the FAA needs to go back through a supply chain of 40 suppliers deep to find out the one furnace that had a problem where uh, that caused that part to fail that's now needed to be written into a quality standard. Uh, but we haven't seen, uh, I think to Mark's point, we haven't seen a real ability of this technology to directly prevent those attacks because uh, cryptography is really only one part and because on the receiving end and on the sending end, it's going to be encrypted and decrypted, it's not trust free. There are tools out there like Leo Lane, uh, which are seeking to create the machine to machine encryption decryption. So in our case, an additive manufacturing system would uh, receive an encrypted file, decrypt and print it. So there's no opportunity for a human, and unless that system is directly compromised or monitored in some way for that to be accessed. But that's, uh, I, I like Mark's graph early on where cryptography is the smallest <laughs> little, little component of this whole ecosystem. John, do you have uh, any thoughts on blockchains and NFTs in this area? I'm not sure I have much useful to say. I mean, you know, like any good buzzword, you know, there may be some value in it, like Kyle was saying. Um, and, and so it's worth a look, but yeah, it's not going to be the end all be all. You know, there's a, a number of other things, you know, SDN, software defined networking, not going to solve all your uh, networking problems, um, but it's worth looking at and seeing if there are is some value in it. So. Yeah, I actually, I want to build on what Kyle was just mentioning about sort of the long supply chains for, for things like a Boeing plane and the, the long part history and things like that. Um, 
with these you know long supply chains that might be multinational in nature where you've got your designs being produced in one country and being manufactured in another country and the two countries might have different attitudes towards cybersecurity and towards you know the regulations that each business is working under uh, what are the sorts of things that people should be wary of when you know outsourcing their production to, to third party producers especially when um, you know, as we're coming into the, the sort of more modern manufacturing cycle where manufacturing's being pushed as a service and, instead of, you know, these long relationships forming that might have been in a more traditional sense. Um, yeah, so, so what are the things that people should be thinking about when they start, you know, exporting their designs for production elsewhere? The, you have the standard risks. Is my design is my IP going to be maintained? Is my design going to be produced correctly? Can I trust the traceability and the level of data being provided by that supplier? Those are some standard uh, concerns that are persistent. But of course, suppliers are now going through a lot of cyber security reviews as part of supplier evaluations. And they use that to tier their suppliers and their supply chain, which is a good thing because that creates then more of a profit motive to being proactive and complying with NIST and seeking out John and saying, John, what can I do? John, do you have uh, any thoughts on, the, on that? Uh, no, uh, in short, no, I'm not uh, up on, enough on the additive manufacturing potential threats there. Um, I will say that, you know, they shouldn't reach out to me directly. Uh, NIST uh, <laughs> runs a, a private, uh, a public-private partnership uh, called the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, MEP. Um, so they should look into that. There are a number of state-level organizations uh, that are associated with that, and they have a number of resources um, that can assist their the manufacturers in various areas. So, Actually, this is a question for Mark um, that's come in. Um, in your initial slides, you had a diagram which showed that the, the relationship between um, additive manufacturing security or, or manufacturing security versus cyber physical security was this intersection with, of, of sort of CPS security, was this intersection with material science. Um, and so that was your, you know, it was a, there was a superset diagram with the additive manufacturing <laughs> and the CPS. And then on your next slide, you, the, it seemed that the difference was in the material science. Um, are there exploits that can be done based on material science for people working in manufacturing? Uh, okay, in my line of work, uh, and my, my focus is mainly on sabotage attacks and sabotage attack detection. So in order to conduct a sabotage attack, I not, uh, it is not enough to hack into system. Even if I hack into 3D printer, what is uh, okay, or if I manage to compromise uh, fir firmware of 3D printer, this is on the first step uh, on what should be done. Then you really need to introduce some modification of, of what you are 3D printing, right? And this can be like Kyle has mentioned, it can be geometry or AM process parameters. And if you think about uh, technologies like powder with fusion, these 130 different uh, parameters that you can uh, manipulate, this, this create complication. And obviously as a computer scientist, I never learned this uh, as a student, okay? I, I pretty much self-taught. So I have to rely on people who have this expertise and do this for a living or for many years or decades. And uh, together we can really design attacks that uh, can be effective. And also from computer science perspective, uh, uh, what I want to do as an attacker is to achieve uh, effect like heart breaks under certain stress conditions but at the same time, I want to reduce probability of detection of this attack. This means that I need to work with material scientists who will tell me what attacks are easier to be detected and what attacks are harder to be detected. For example, where I integrate my defect. Is it inside of a part? Is it closer to the surface, etc.? So you have to work with different disciplines to, to design attacks. Uh, or, uh, also for detection, it's maybe a little bit different than switch of topics. I'm actually a fan of uh, side channel based detection of 
sabotage attacks, then you measure such nominations during manufacturing process. And then you can have a gold signature of a verifiable benign process. And then you can compare the signature using such a base signature with the gold signature. And then you can detect uh, some deviations, right? But also here you have to have uh, additional experts like uh, signal processing experts who really know how to work with analog signal. Because I, I disclose you uh, a secret, uh, computer scientists usually don't know how to process signals, okay? Or how to work in analog world. But even though all computers are work, uh, work on, on top of analog uh, world, but this means that for different aspects of security, we really need to have different combination of uh, experts, right? Yeah, so building on that, um, you know, the, the, the defense is what you were just mentioning. Um, you know, a lot of the defense that people are going to be thinking about are securing their IP, right? So I have some design files. I don't want people to steal those design files. When it comes to defending yourself against other classes of cyber attacks, as you're mentioning, like sabotage, and you, you've brought in um, side channel analysis as a form of defense, um, are there other kinds of defenses that people should be aware of? You know, like, can we do finite element analysis to keep track of the properties of our parts to tell if someone's manipulated them? Or, uh, you know, is there some, you said this kind of comes back to the blockchain again, is there some way that we can track changes to our parts as they move through the production life cycle to see if um, anyone introduces them? Uh, is there anything like that uh, currently being proposed or available on the market? Uh, I have seen proposals with finite element analysis. I have seen also proposals with, uh, okay, obviously, it's, uh, with, with cybersecurity, you all have uh, the problem is that uh, cyber security solutions need to be deployed on the same machines that you are trying to uh, protect. And one of the limit limiting factors is you cannot deploy the solutions on 3D printer itself. And the reason is uh, it will, uh, this high probability, uh, interfere with real, uh, hot real time uh, requirements. Because especially in Padwet Fusion machines, uh, you have uh, completely different timing requirements than in FDM machine, right? And if you just in, uh, uh, install your antivirus, whatever uh, flavor you like on a 3D printer, and it will start interfering with your manufacturing process, uh, your antivirus will actually uh, damage more parts than uh, safe. Uh, and this, this is a problem uh, or this is a limiting factor where you can apply your uh, cybersecurity solutions. For example, on the computer side to, uh, to protect design files, yes. To protect uh, uh, software like slices, yes. To a certain extent to protect uh, network communication, yes. But what happens if somebody hacked into a router, right? Through which you have this network communication to 3D printer. Or what happens if you have somebody uh, really compromised your firmware or 3D printer? This, this is a really hard problems, right? And uh, I, I don't say you don't have to uh, employ cybersecurity solutions on the computer side. You definitely do have to do this. I just say that uh, when you are doing this, you have to realize what are limitations of these approaches, right? What you gain with these approaches and what are still limitations. And then for whatever limitations, uh, I think John mentioned this, that perimeter defense doesn't work, right? So we went from perimeter defense to in-depth defense and nowadays you have zero trust uh, principle. Uh, so we, we went through different iterations in cybersecurity world, what works and what doesn't. So we really need to uh, use this understanding from cybersecurity world to build our security for additive. So, my take. And, and to add on to that, uh, this sabotage topic, I think is very interesting. I like the, the AM process plus material science in part breakdown. I think that's good, a good way to look at it. The what we've seen uh, out there in, in the research space, uh, some work actually done at NYU, 
around uh, chemical and some radioactive markers, some signatures that can be printed in and confirmed via CT scanning that can tell you if there's some level of uh, failure or uh, a part has been compromised. The way that uh, I simplify <laughs> and maybe wrongly, the sabotage idea is uh, planned obsolescence done in a nefarious way. Uh, so thinking about fatigue and thinking about uh, vibrations and you want this part to fail on its 10,000th vibration so it's not detected because you know that it's only tested up to 10,000 vibrations. So that's a very hard to detect but very effective method of sabotage. And uh, it's interesting because even without sabotage, we're facing that challenge in material science for added manufactured parts anyway. It's very difficult to uh, really get high confidence bounds on those as part of a quality control activity. Uh, but there's this additional layer that makes it very interesting when you also have to consider these other concerns. Um, so John, we've got a question coming in probably from a, um, a student saying, uh, with your Center for Excellence and things like that, um, are there any grants or fellowships that promote research in the field of additive manufacturing security for students or for researchers? Um, you know, what, what, what are the sorts of uh, funding mechanisms available for people who are interested in working in this area? Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, immediately from uh, the centers that we're working with. Um, certainly there are a number of other groups uh, in the government that are looking at this. Um, I would say we, we certainly do uh, bring in interns and, and things like that uh, to help work on these problems. And we are interested in partnering with external uh, folks when, when, when we can. Uh, I guess sort of also related to that would be um, uh, uh, your university, Mark, and um, your company as well, uh, Kyle. You know, do you do you bring in people um, regularly to to work on this kind of thing? Um, you know, introducing them to the cybersecurity and uh, promoting work in that area. Uh, not during COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but, but but generally, yes, they, they are uh, they, they are trying to uh, also uh, Dr. Gupta and I and several other professors from different universities. We are trying to establish uh, collaboration across universities, so that both uh, beneficial for both professors and students, and hopefully it will help us to bring students from one university to another for summer internship or similar. So. And and for us, we of course have a lot of folks that specialize and look at this area in particular. And it's interesting bringing really what we look for in those with manufacturing experience that in, understand that process and exposing them to the world of software and cybersecurity is always fun. All right, we're getting close to the end of time now. So um, I'll just ask each of you if you've got any sort of closing remarks or thoughts um, to sort of round off this discussion. You know, what, what again, you know, what should people take from this presentation in your opinion? What, what should people be thinking about? Um, you can, uh, I'll, I'll nominate the order. John, you can go first. Uh, the end takeaway is panic. No. Uh, uh, the, the end thing is that, you know, uh, additive manufacturing is is a very promising field and you know there's a lot of um, promise in the ability to print parts on demand and we shouldn't hide we shouldn't be afraid of it because of cybersecurity that being said we need to do all of the basic things for cybersecurity we need to you know do password management we need to do you know uh, put up the fence around it because if you don't have you know we need to do all the basic things um, there is a lot of additional challenges added in manufacturing, and so we look to Mark and Kyle to do those, uh, and folks at Miter as well, uh, to do that research into how do we secure uh, these hard problems? How do we just secure the distribution of the files? How do we make sure the, print, the, the final product is printed correctly? But let's do the basic things first, and, and we'll, we'll get to the hard stuff. Thanks, John. Um, Mark, would you like to go next? 
Uh, yeah, uh, I do. Okay, first of all, I agree with John, panic, <laughs> right? But at the same time, uh, uh, I, I would also uh, like to say that uh, cyber cyber security is necessary. Uh, without cyber security, we cannot secure additive. At the same time, we need to understand that cyber is just the first step in securing additive. And uh, to make uh, second and third and whatever ste steps are needed, you really need to build multidisciplinary teams. Thanks. And Kang? I'd, I'd summarize and say, yes, there are risk, risks and trade-offs uh, everywhere, especially in a new and advanced manufacturing process, and no blockchain won't solve all our problems. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Uh, all right, um, just to wrap up, I'd just like to quickly share my slides again. Um, so thanks again to our panelists, uh, John, Mark, and Kyle. It's um, been really great to have you on today. Um, and again, thank you to our sponsors, the National Science Foundation and the NYU Center for Cybersecurity, and our organizers, Professor Gupta, um, Professor Curry, uh, and Gary Mack, and myself. Um, I'd also like to in uh, invite everyone who is here and our attendees to join our next panel, um, which is going to be looking at the um, strengths that can come from diversity and inclusion in research and in the workforce. Uh, and for that, we actually have um, a moderator, um, Heba Mahmood, who's the Senior Manager of Inclusion and Diversity coming from MITRE Corporation as well. Um, the link for this presentation at, and webinar, like all of our previous webinars, this is actually the sixth um, that we've done uh, will be posted to our YouTube channel. Um, we did four panels last year, and this is the second one for this year. The next panel is on June the 3rd, and the registration link is down there. We'll also email that out to the attendees via the Eventbrite system. Um, so thanks again, everyone, uh, and um, have a good day. Thank you.